Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to go over part 5 of Ancient and Modern Ships. It is highly probable that the latter half of the 14th century witnessed many improvements in ships built in the Mediterranean. This was no doubt due in part to the intense commercial rivalry that existed at the time between Venice and the other Italian republics. Figure 34 is taken from an MS Vir uh, Virgil in the Riccardi Library, which has been reproduced in M. Jowell's work. It represents an Italian two-masted sailing ship of this period. This is one of the earliest illustrations of a ship with a permanent forecastle forming part of the structure of the vessel. The stern castle also appears to have a permanent, though not a structural character. Ships of somewhat similar type were used in England in the reign of Richard II at the end of the 14th century. Figure 35 represents one of them, the original being an, an illustrated manuscript in the Harleian Library. It was written by a Frenchman of the name of Francis de Lamarck in Richard's reign. There are illustrations and manuscripts still in existence written about this period, which confirm the fact that this type of ship was then prevalent. The reign of Henry V um, from 1413 to 1422 was one of great naval development. The king himself took a, ma uh, took a most ardent interest in the Royal Navy and frequently inspected the ships during their construction. Under his, under his auspices, some very large vessels were built for the fleet. Lists of this king's ships are still in existence. They are classified under the names Great Ships, Cogs, Carracks, Ships, Barges, and Ballingers. The largest of the Great Ships was the Jesus of 1,000 tons, the Holocaust of 760, the Trinity Royal of 540, and the Christopher Spain of 600. The last mention was a prize captured by the Earl of Huntingdon. The majority of the ships were, however, from 420 to 120 tons. The Carracks were apparently not English-built ships, as all those in the King's Navy were prizes captured in 1416 and 1417. The three largest were of 600, 550, and 500 tons, respectively. The barges are given as of 100 tons, and the Bollingers uh, range from 120 to 80 tons. The total strength of the Royal Navy about the year 1420, as given in the list compiled by W. M. Oppenheim from the Counts of the Keepers of the King's Ships, is 38. Of these, 17 were ships, 7 were carracks, 2 were barges, and 12 were ballingers. It is worthy of notice that there were no galleys included in the list. Uh, figure 34 and figure 35 um, have Italian sailing ship as are depictions of an Italian sailing ship and an English ship. Henry invaded France in 1415 with a fleet of 1,400 vessels, which had been raised by impressing every ship of 20 tons and upwards. The home supply not being sufficient for his purpose, Henry sent commission commissioners to Holland and Zealand to hire additional vessels. In all, 1,500 ships were collected and 1,400 were, utilize, were utilized. This figure gives us a fair idea of the resources of this country in shipping at that time. This was the invasion which resulted in the victory of Agincourt and the capture of Harfleur. In the year following 1416, France was again invaded and the fleet was stated by some to have numbered 300 and by others 400 ships. A naval battle was fought off of Harfleur. It resulted in a complete victory for Henry. The old tactics and the old weapons seem to have been used. Although, as we have seen, guns have been used in sea fights nearly 40 years previously, and there is no mention of their having been employed on either side at this battle. In 1417, the king again collected 1,500 vessels at Southampton for a fresh invasion of France. Having first obtained the command of the sea by a naval victory over the French and the Genoese, a landing was duly effected near Harfleur. Several vessels, including four large carracks, were captured in the sea fight and were added to the king's navy. During the reign of Henry V, the mercantile marine of uh, England made no progress. Commerce was checked in consequence of the state of war which prevailed, and the improvements in shipbuilding seemed to have been com confined to the Royal Navy. It seems probable, however, that the experience gained in the construction and navigation of the very large ships which the king had added to the navy had its effect, ultimately improving the type of merchant vessels. During the 40 years of the reign of Henry VI, England was so greatly exhausted and impoverished, and impoverished by war with France and by internal dissensions at home that commerce and shipbuilding made little progress. 
We possess a sketch, a sketch of the of a ship of the early part of the reign of Henry VI. It is contained in a manuscript in the Harleian Library of the date, probably of 1430 to 1435. It is reproduced in figure 36 and differs from the ship of the reign of Richard II, shown in figure 35, sheeply in having the poop and forecastle more strongly developed. While England was steadily declining in power from the time of the death of Henry V, a new maritime nation was arising in southwestern Europe, whose discoveries were destined to have the most marked effect on the seaborne commerce and consequently on the shipbuilding of the world. In the year 1417, the Portuguese, under the guidance of Prince Henry the Navigator, commenced their exploration of the west coast of Africa, and they continued it with persistency during the century. In 1418, they discovered, or rather rediscovered, the island of Madeira, for it, was, for it is extremely probable that it was first visited by an Englishman of the name of Machin. The Portuguese prince firmly believed that a route could be opened around Africa to the Indies. To reach these regions by sea seems to have been the goal of the great explorers of the 15th century, and the Portuguese were stimulated in their endeavors by a grant from Pope Martin V of all territories, which might thenceforward be discovered between Cape Bahador and the East Indies. In 1446, an expedition consisting of six caravels was fitted out and made a voyage to Guinea. It resulted in the discovery of the Cape Verde Islands. The caravel was a type of ship much used by the countries of southern Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. A description of a Spanish vessel, a vessel of this type is given on pages 87 to 89. In 1449, the Azores, the Azores were discovered. In 1481, a lucrative trade was opened up between Portugal and the natives of Guinea. Six years afterwards, the Cape of Good Hope was reached by Barth uh, Bartholomew Bartho Diaz, and in 1497, it was doubled by Vasco da Gama. During a great uh, part of the period in which the Portuguese were thus occupied in extending their commerce and in paving the way for great discoveries, the condition of England, owing to the French War and to the subsequent Wars of the Roses, was passing from bad to worse. Nevertheless, the spirit of commercial un enterprise was not wholly extinguished. A few merchants seem to have made fortunes in the shipping trade, and among them may be mentioned the famous William Cunyang Caning of Bristol, who was probably the greatest private ship owner in England at the end of the reign of Henry VI, and during the time of he Edward the Fourth. Canine uh, traded to Iceland, Finland, and the Mediterranean. He said to have possessed ships as large as 900 tons, and it is recorded in his monument in the church of St. Mary Redcliffe in Bristol that he at one time lent ships to the extent of 2,670 tons to Edward IV. It is also related of him that he owned 10 ships and employed 800 soldiers, sailors and 100 artisans. It was not till the year 1475, upon the conclusion of peace between Edward and the French king, Louis, that affairs quieted down in England, and then trade and commerce made most marvelous progress. The king himself was one of the leading merchants of the country and, had, and concluded treaties of commerce with Denmark, Brittany, Castille, Burgundy, France, Zealand, and the Hanseatic League. In the reign of Edward's successor, Richard III, English seaborne trade obtained a firm footing in Italy and other Mediterranean countries. We fortunately possess drawings which show that an, that an enormous advance was made in shipbuilding during the period under discussion, or that at any rate the advance had by that time reached England. Figure 37 illustrates a large ship of the latter half of the 15th century. It's taken from a manuscript in the Cotonian Library by John Rue, the celebrated Warwickshire antiquary and historian. This manuscript records the life and history of Richard Beauchamp, uh, the Earl of Warwick, who was born in 1381 and died in 1439. The author of the manuscript, however, lived till 1491 in the early part of the reign of Henry VII, and we may therefore conclude that the illustrations represent ships of the latter half of the 15th century. The vessel shown in figure 37 was used for war purposes, as four guns were mounted in the broadside. There were also four masts and a bowsprit, and a strongly developed forecastle, which formed part of the structure of the ship. There was uh, apparently very luxurious accommodation provided for passengers and officers in a large deck house at the poop. The mainsail was of very large dimensions and was emblazoned with the arms of the Earl of Warwick. In this illustration, we see an early approach to the modern type of sailing ship. There are several drawings of other ships in the same manuscripts, and most of them have the same general characteristics as figure 37. 
The reign of Henry VII, uh, from 1485 to 1509, was memorable in the annals of navigation and commerce. Two years after he came to the throne, the Portuguese sent the expedition, previously referred to, to discover a route to the Indies around Africa. The expedition never reached its destination, but Diaz succeeded in discovering the Cape of Good Hope. A few years later, in 1492, Christopher Columbus made his famous attempt to reach the Indies by sailing west. This expedition, as is well known, resulted in the discovery of the West Indian Islands and shortly uh, afterwards of the mainland of America. The ships which Columbus took with him on his voyage were three in number and small in size, as Spain had possessed many large vessels for a century and a half before the time of Columbus. It is probable that he was entrusted with small ships only because the government did not care to risk much capital in so adventuresome an undertaking. Fortunately, we have a fairly exact knowledge of the form and the dimensions of the caravel Santa Maria, which was the largest of the three vessels. She was, reconstru she was reconstructed in 1892 and uh, 93 at the arsenal of Caraco by Spanish workmen under the superintendence of Senor Leopold Wilk for the Chicago expedition of 1893. Senor Wilk had access to every known a source of information. Figures 38 to 40 give a general view, sail plan, and lines of this ship as is reconstructed. The following were her leading dimensions. The length of the keel was 60 to 68 feet. The length between perpendiculars was 74 to 12. Uh, 74 and around 12 feet. The extreme length of the ship proper was 93 inches. The length over, sorry, 93 feet. The length overall was 128.25 uh, feet. The breadth and the, uh, the breadth and the extreme were 25.71 feet. The displacement was fully, with it being fully laden, was 233 tons, and the weight of the hull was 90.5 tons. The Santa Maria, like most vessels of her time, was provided with an extensive forecastle, which overhung the stem nearly 12 feet. She also had an enormous structure aft, consisting of half and quarter decks above the main deck. She also had three masts and a bowsprit. The latter and the fore and main masts were square-rigged, and the mizzen was latine-rigged. The outside of the hull was strengthened with vertical and longitudinal timber beams. The Santa Maria, as reproduced, was sailed across the Atlantic from Spain by Captain D.V. Concas and a Spanish crew in the year 1893. The course taken was exactly the same as that followed by Columbus on his first voyage. The time occupied was 36 days, and, and the maximum speed attained was about 6.5 knots. The vessel pitched horribly. In 1497, the first English, English expedition was made to America under John Cabot. We have no particulars of the ship in which Cabot sailed, but it could not have been a large one, as it is known that the crew only numbered 18. The expedition uh, sailed from Bristol in the month of May, and land, uh, which was probably Cape Breton, was sighted on June 24th. Bristol was reached on the return journey at the end of July. In the following year, Cabot made another journey and explored the coast of North America from Cape Breton to as far south as Cape Hatteras. Many of their expeditions of the same directions were fitted out in the last years of the 15th and the first years of the 16th centuries. While Cabot was uh, returning from his first voyage to North America, one of the most famous and most epoch-making expeditions of discovery of modern times was fitted out in Portugal. On July 24, 1497, Vasco da Gama set sail from the Tagus in the hopes of reaching India via the Cape of Good Hope. His squadron consisted of three ships, named the San Gabriel, the San Rafael, and the Birio, together with a transport to carry stores. There is a painting in existence at Lisbon, uh, of, at Lisbon of the San Gabriel, which is supposed to be authentic. It represents her as having a high poop and forecastle very much like the caravel Santa Maria. She had four masts and a bowsprit. The latter and the fore and main masts were square-rigged. The San Gabriel was, however, a much larger vessel than the Santa Maria. She is said to have been constructed to carry 400 pipes of wine. This would be equivalent to about 400 tons measurement, or from 250 to 300 tons register. The other ships selected were of about the same dimensions and of similar equipment and rig, in order that in the event of losses or accidents, each of the ships might make use of any of the spars, tackle, or fittings belonging to the others. 
It may here be mentioned that the ships reached Kuliamane on the east coast of South Africa on January 22, 1498, through many visits to East African ports during which they satisfied themselves that the arts of navigation were as well understood by the eastern seamen as by themselves, they set sail for India early in August. After a voyage of 20, or some may say, 23 days, they sighted the coast and shortly afterwards arrived in Calicut, nearly 14 months after they started from Lisbon. About this time, the Mamluk sultans of Egypt absolutely cut off the trade which had been carried on for centuries between the Italian Republicans and the Malabar coast of India via the overland route and the Red Sea. It was this fact that gave the discovery of the sea route to India such enormous importance, and ultimately it was one of the, ca of the causes of the commercial downfall of the Italian republics. The Cape route became the great high road of commerce to the east and remained so down to the present reign When the re and remained so down to the present reign, when the re-establishment of the overland route and eventually the successful cutting of the Suez Canal restored commerce to its old paths. The discoveries of Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Jean Cabot, and their successors had an enormous influence upon shipbuilding, as they not only widened the area of seaborne commerce, but offered strong inducements to navigators to venture on the great oceans far from land in crafts specially designed, uh, specially adapted for such voyages. Hitherto, sailors had either navigated uh, from land and had na either navigated the great inland seas of Europe or had engaged in the coasting trade and the longest and the longest voyages undertaken before the end of the 15th century were probably those which English merchants made between Bristol and Iceland and between our eastern ports and Bergen. Henry VII not only encouraged commerce and voyages of discovery, but also paid great attention to the needs of the Royal Navy. He added two warships to his fleet, which were more powerful vessels than any previously employed in this country. One of them named the Regent was copied from a French ship of 600 tons and was built on the Rother about 1490. She carried four masts and a bowsprit and was armed with 225 small guns called serpentines. The second ship was named the Sovereign, and it is remarkable as showing the connection at that time between land and naval architecture that she was built under the superintendence of Sir Reginald Bray, who is also the architect of Henry VII's chapel at Westminster Abbey and of St. George's Chapel, Windsor. The Sovereign carried 141 serpentines. The Regent was burnt in an action off of a breast in the reign of Henry VIII in the year 1512. She caught fire from a large French carrot called the Mary la Cordelier, in which she was uh, attacking. Both ships were utterly destroyed. The Mary la Cordelier was probably the largest warship of her time. She is said to have carried 1,200 men and to have lost 900 killed in the action. She was built at Morlaix at the sole cost of Anne of Brittany, the Queen of France. The regent was replaced by a very famous ship called the Henry Grasse Doom, otherwise known as the Great Harry. As a consequence, uh, most probably of the size and force of some of the French ships, as revealed in the action off Brest, the Henry Grasse Doom was a great advance on any previous Brit British warship. She was built at Erith and was probably launched in June 1514. Her tonnage is given in a manuscript in Pepes uh, Miscellanies as 1,500 but it is generally believed that she did not in reality exceed 1,000 tons. All right, everyone, um, I'll, uh, start the, I, uh, I'll start the next part um, later today. So, yep, see you guys then.